Tim. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being interested in this particular subject. I, I know that many of you have pressing problems, and that when you can solve those, your, your skills will pass on to the people you are helping. So it's important for you to be able to solve your problems in order to have credibility for solving other people's problems. So thank you to the organization who goes to this great expense and effort to promote natural healing. That is my particular interest because it's related to cause. Uh, clinical healing is not related to cause. I'm interested in finding the causes of ill health and the causes of health, too. What it is, in other words, cures. Uh, you can't have a cure, by my definition, unless you know the cause. But you could accidentally forget it, but <laughs> it's much more efficient to try to find a cause, and from that you can work on a cure. And I think that's much more useful to all of our society than finding uh, a treatment that works temporarily. Meanwhile, letting the whole situation get worse because the cause isn't known. I got interested in the cause of cancer about, well, I've always been interested because I saw the devastation around me in my own family and other people's families. And, but I got seriously interested when I just accidentally saw a cause um, being uh, a biologist by training. And uh, also having a hobby of uh, radio, amateur radio, I came up with a device that could give me much more information than what, than, than what we're all accustomed to. And the device, I just brought it to show you, so you can see it is nothing that fills a room with $100,000 worth of equipment. This is what I used. It's a kit intended for children. You can put it together the way you put any little puzzle together. You don't have to be able to solder. And you can make many different kinds of circuits with it. And one of them is a simple little oscillator circuit. I used that and could find much more information than you could ever find with, say, a simple voltmeter, which is about all that's used for, for people. I mean, other areas of research have, have zoomed ahead. You can see in our telephones, our, our recreations, our, our music, everything has zoomed ahead except health. Health has gone the other direction because of suppressive forces, which have always been with, with humans. Humans are competitive, and they don't want other people to uh, compete with their products and their concepts, uh, and that's the nature of human being. But unless we understand that, <laughs> we will be sacrificed to that principle, and uh, so that you don't have to be uh, one of those who get sacrificed I want to make all my information public so that those who want to join the ranks of scientists of, uh, in the public, uh, in the public, uh, on, on the street, scientists who are trying to uh, study and understand the causes of ill health and, and what decides on health, who are interested in finding those causes, you can. It's fairly 
straightforward and I'll demonstrate it tomorrow. And so I would be happy to see everybody there because that's why I brought it, so that everybody could feel competent to make the kind of discoveries that I am making. You don't have to be so sophisticated in every detail, but you can be sophisticated in your own way. Now, uh, I started by finding accidentally a cause of cancer about 20 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago. And I was so shocked that, of course, I didn't believe it. And that's another uh, property you, you need to acquire, too, and that is tremendous skepticism, which I think you already have. You're certainly skeptical of clinical medicine, and that's good enough, that degree. Uh, I thought that the way to decide whether something really was a cause, not just an association, uh, was not the way that the academic and clinical uh, sciences are doing it. See, the way they are doing it is that they are having agencies who are at work finding carcinogens. Whenever, and, and it's a very big research area and a very big business, too. So that when, when research is done, and that's what's giving all the young scientists their jobs, you, you understand, they decide who gets the jobs. Uh, if you if you do a, a, uh, enough research work, possibly 10 years worth, out of the public money, uh, then they will decide, uh, eventually, uh, when they meet in, in France, uh, whether that item, let's say it's a new fruit juice, <laughs> uh, whether that item is carcinogenic or nearly carcinogenic and so on, and so you get a list of, of their evaluations. The organization that does that is called IARC, and we just call it IARC for short, International Association for Research in Cancer. That's the most prestigious organization. So you would think that if I, and, and you would expect everybody, to have respect for that organization, and I certainly do. It's just that their, their criteria of what is cause and what isn't are different. They will generalize and use their ideas. So, in other words, <coughs> theoretically based, and I am not, I'm empirically based. That's the fundamental difference, and I think that's what distinguishes you, too. You believe in what works, not what somebody says should work, and therefore does work, and therefore you assume that it does, and therefore you, 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 once you're assuming that it does, Let's say you assume that vitamin C is good for cancer. You don't have any evidence yourself. But if you assume it, then you will buy it, and you will give it, and you will take it. And there is commerce for you. But I don't do it that way. I did it differently right from the start. I saw three cancer patients fairly close together because it just happened that way. And at the time, just by chance, I was testing everybody for parasites, even though I knew that they didn't exist in humans. Well, that's the nature of a scientist at heart, right? You just try it anyway, because maybe it does. Uh, human knowledge is so inadequate. <laughs> so. And I wanted to use my set, right? My set of parasites. Uh, I found this outrageous parasite uh, with uh, larval stages to it 
all of which I had studied uh, and, and knew all the details, it's just that I had never made the logical connection that if the pigs uh, in this country and all around us, in fact, that's where we got our specimens for the parasitology class, because we each saw them and we made slides out of that. That's what the class was about. Uh, I didn't put two and two together because you can get very off base when you mix theoretical ideas with actual empirical ideas. Often they don't fit at all. And in this case, it's a terrible misfit because for our parasitology classes, we just went to the abattoir. That is, I didn't as a pupil, but <coughs> the instructor went to get the parasites for us for our parasitology class. And there they were, all these flukes and roundworms and flatworms. The, flat, the, the tapes were pretty ugly. The others were shocking, more than ugly. <laughs> and, um, and there they all were. Uh, but I had never put two and two together to think that humans could have such things. And we're all in a bit of a mindset that was quite wrong just because um, we're listening to authorities and we're, we have a theoretical attitude. But after I tested these three patients with, uh, they weren't my patients at that time, but, uh, but <coughs> they were there for consulting over nutritional ideas, that's what I was uh, working with. And it wasn't for their cancer, it was for something else, of course, because I knew theoretically, and quite wrong, that there could be no nutritional influence. So you see, we've come a long way. <laughs> and uh, I noticed that never in all the others I had tested were there any cases of this particular parasite called the human intestinal fluke. Uh, but these three cancer cases did each have them. And I thought that was too, too suspicious to just let go. And uh, eventually, uh, I found a, a, a way that I would test it for myself. I uh, decided that the way to see it, if this really is just an association, even though it was 100% wasn't convincing enough to me, three out of three isn't enough. Um, if it was, but I wasn't about to get 300 in less than a number of years, I, I couldn't wait for getting more, so I thought I would do it differently. I would try to kill it after, and that took me about a year, a year or a year to two years, because I had never heard of herbs before, and I didn't know that there was some uh, there was some historical background to uh, treating with herbs, and uh, I didn't know that books existed, and where, or even I hadn't really gone to a health food store, I don't think, either. <laughs> I found that that's where you would find these books. Uh, so eventually, I turned to the things that I had at my disposal. I had a black walnut tree right in my own yard. And very often that does happen, that you have what you need right on your shelf. So you have to remind yourself of that little principle. There's a possibility that the answer is on your shelf. Use that while you're waiting. 